Hello, I'm Monsignor Jim Asante. Today on Personally Speaking, our guest is Stephen May. Stephen comes from Australia, where he is an actor and a singer, a great performer, wonderful talent. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and Australian actor and singer Stephen May joins me now. Stephen graduated from Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts in 2006 with a Bachelor of Arts in Music Theatre. His theatre credits include the Australian tours of Miss Saigon, Mamma Mia, also starred in Jersey Boys. He lives in Melbourne, and we're happy to be able to speak with him from his home in Australia. He's going to talk to us today about his life, his career, the values that matter the most to him. I'm delighted to welcome back to Personally Speaking, our friend, the great actor and Australian tenor, Stephen May. Stephen May, thanks for coming back on our program, Personally Speaking. Great to have you back. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Stephen, let me ask you, uh, when we last got together, it was early on in the pandemic, and I remember I had gone to New York City to see a play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And the next night after I saw it, they said, one of the ushers handing out programs at Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf has come down as positive for the coronavirus, and then that shut down the theater in New York pretty much from then on. As a creative artist who is especially important, active in the theater, what did you do with the bulk of the pandemic? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, what did I do? I think for the first part, I think we're all in a little bit of um, disbelief that, like, oh, this will be over in a couple of weeks. Um, right. And, yeah, we sort of, and as we saw that it was sort of a good couple of years, and especially in Australia, um, I, I ended up working at home for a telecommunications company. Uh, mm. I was lucky to be able to score a job that wasn't, performing um i didn't really get that creative flow that every sort of a lot of people got i i sort of felt no i need to bunker down earn some money uh and i did for about nine months just work for a for a communication telecommunications company wow. and then once the uh, the doors started to open up that's when i was like okay are we allowed out uh shows are gonna happen again and um melbourne especially in australia i think we're the the longest lockdown city in the world um, they went into continuous lockdown. So it was very different from the States. Mm -hmm. and, and and that lockdown, uh, well received by the people or resisted? I think it was very mixed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, look, you know, there, there's certainly two sides to every um, incident that happens in the world, but it's definitely, yeah. we, we, had, we had some divided people, that's for sure. Yeah. And and who decides? Is in the end the government that decides such a thing? Yeah, it was the government. And then we had uh, each state had their own government uh, governing what was happening during that time as well. So uh, at times our federal government and then we had um, the state government, they were looking after it saying, okay, well, as Victoria, as a state, we're going to say, well, we're locking our borders to everybody so nobody can come in and nobody can go out. Mm -hmm. uh, and other states started to block other states out so western <laughs> australia they were they're so far away they're about a four and a half hour flight away from everywhere and they said well we don't want anyone over here uh we've got sort of zero to a hundred cases which right. these days sounds very very small but in australia those cases at the at, at the start was was quite you know they were daunting we were told you know this this virus is going to uh swipe through the nation and you know we don't know what's going to happen so in comparison to the states i mean it was um it was sort of took, it took my breath away. I mean, you saw what happened over there in just the millions, and I yeah. was we're worried about hundreds, you know. So, right, right. in comparison to how many people we have here, but it really was, um, yeah, it was quite a shock. And I, I still, I think, still feel that kind of energy around sometimes where you go to different areas where you, where you were during the pandemic, and you're like, oh, it still kind of lingers there. It hasn't. It's everything is open and everything is working. It's just I think have an emotional recall to it all. Yeah. Stephen, did you manage to get through the whole pandemic without getting the virus? I got the virus uh, once 
Um, and that was because we started up a show. I did The Wedding Singer oh, okay. and uh, we started rehearsals and we were going to go into from Victoria to Sydney. And as soon as we all got to Sydney, the whole cast got it. Uh, mm. I was very lucky to only get a very minor side effect. I had itchy ears of all things. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I'm, I'm quite fit and healthy and I think, it's regardless. I don't think you can manage. Yeah. Or if you, you could be the fittest person in the in the world and still get coronavirus and have bad side effects. I was just very lucky to uh, yeah. to have very little. Yeah. So when once you engage with other people, that's always the risk. I I live with my hundred and two year old mother, and I kept telling her we're going to live like Anne Frank for a while, Mom, because I can't have you interact with other people. Always worried about her getting it, and for old people. Yeah. That would be a real serious thing. Now, you know, uh, Julian Ovenden, the actor in England, was telling us that he used the uh, the pandemic time as a time to keep working his instrument. He's a, a singer and an actor. Did you do anything to to keep your instrument, your creative instrument, going? Uh, I started doing singing lessons uh, uh, more so online, um, and I think that was it. Was kind of really interesting because I thought, wow, this could be kind of what the future is that we're just going to talk to people online and how do I use my craft that way? Um, and we kind of went back to basics, uh, figuring out where my voice was sitting at the time and uh, working on the lower resonance of my voice, which really mm. helped um, because I was doing a lot of shows beforehand and it was all quite high and having to sing really high notes. And mm. I'd kind of forgotten that I'd have this bass baritone voice as well. That does support the, uh, once you're using your breath properly, then the support mm -hmm. of the can take up and float up to the high notes as well. Okay. Stephen, years ago, I had the opportunity on TV to interview an actor from Australia who was kind of the rage of New York, uh, a guy named David Campbell, who I think is still active down there, or maybe has a TV show, but uh, Jimmy Barnes' son he was. But I mention yeah. that because uh, uh, much as he was the rage of New York and very successful in a Broadway play and all that stuff, uh, there came a point where he just needed to go back to Australia. Uh, I mention that because, uh, without sounding like one of these arrogant Americans again, between what they do in Hollywood and what they do in New York and what they do in the uh, movies and television and theater, New the United States is certainly a capital of, of creative work. Uh, I think so. Wh why have you chosen to stay in Australia? Why haven't we had you move to New York or Los Angeles? Tell us why staying in Australia makes sense for you. Well, I, I kind of forced to stay here at the moment. Um, I don't have the ability to sort of get a, a visa to come and work there. It is kind of ah. still in my pipe dream uh, to do that. There were a couple of times where I went through the immigration process and um, didn't quite get to the final final hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the pandemic certainly has shifted a lot of my priorities and where I want to be and how I want to grow up um, with a family um, and also with schooling for kids and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, very different. Like we have a very, um, we've got a great healthcare. We've got a great schooling um, facilities. We also have some of the best beaches in the world that I don't know if <laughs> I can say goodbye to but just yet. Um, but it is still a pipe dream to actually to come and live and work over. I would actually come and live and work in New York or some yeah definitely new york or chicago is looking good la is great and i think you know everyone wants to be in hollywood uh but i think if i could have a mixture of musicals and tv i i would be very happy but it's still it's still there it's still something that's niggling away at me going go on give it a go but it's just finding the right path and the right avenue to get there um you're right though because new york and or most you know creative players in in the states is something that we do aspire to and we strive to to do um I think we've got some great talent in Australia, as we've seen um, yeah. come, come across the screens. And as you said, David Campbell is a perfect example, who is someone not too far away of reach of who mm. I've been around, uh, who is quite prominent in our industry here. He runs the um, the morning show here. So he's a uh, uh, news presenter at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, but he's a wonderful singer. He's got a great family. And uh, his partner, Lisa Campbell, she's she works within the industry as well in casting. So, yeah, they're not too far away from uh, from where I am. He's, he was a very, very fine guy. I enjoyed interviewing him, and he was, we're talking 20 years ago, he was a, a youngster then, and but New York fell in love with him, and uh, it looked like that was going to be his future, and he changed. Uh, can can you, going back to working in the United States, if you have to, Stephen, Stephen Mays, our guest, can you talk like us New Yorkers? 
Well, funny enough, I uh, I just did a show called Beautiful, the Carol King musical. Oh, sure, uh, yeah. And so it's it was really interesting listening to your to your accent because it's like, <laughs> no, Carol, Carol King, it's it's Jerry Gordon, <laughs> and, and, and I was like, oh, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back home again. Here we go. <laughs> but Long Island's a little little different, but yeah, it was uh, it's really lovely to hear your accent actually. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind, Stephen. Yeah, b- born in Brooklyn, raised on Long Island, and spending a lot of time in Manhattan throughout my life. But you know, for anyone looking at, if you look up Stephen May online, you see this unbelievably busy uh, curriculum vitae. He's he's done so many plays, so many musicals. I'm, I mention that though because I'm I'm wondering, even for a, an actor who works a lot as you have, inevitably every actor says, "I went for this part. I was so right for it. Didn't get it." What have you worked out in your life about dealing with disappointment or not getting that which you set your heart on? It, it, yeah, I think as an actor, you really have to have some other thick skin or uh, mm. support network around you. There have been certainly been roles or moments where I've gotten through to the last round. And, you know, what happens in Australia is a lot of people come from America or the United Kingdom and they're you auditioning. And there would be 20 people in front of you at a big panel tables. And I think... You know, multiple times I've been in the room where you're like, okay, it's it's down to you and this other guy or you and this other woman. And you sort of go, okay, like you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to go, right. I've got this. Like I'm, I'm really good. I'm confident. And you walk away. You think, yeah, I was pretty good. And then you get your call from the agent. It's like, oh, I didn't go your way this time. And there is that moment of just, you know, it, you, you, def- you feel deflated. You put all this hard work in. Um, then you have to realize, you know, that, that chance that you do get, you know, I've had some amazing chances and also I've had a lot of no's, but it's not about you anymore. Like it comes down to, you're not, not talented. Mm-hmm. Uh, you put in the hard work. I think there are times when I haven't put in the work and I didn't get it. And I go, well, you didn't put in the work, but I know if I put in all my hours of working, doing my training, getting up and, you know, not just doing my artwork, but also doing my self work that everything kind of will pan out. Okay. Um, it's disappointing. And yes, you know, you have a bit of a cry or uh, yeah. you sort of say, okay, well, say la vie. It, it is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. The sun comes up tomorrow when you just have to move on. Um, some are harder than others, of course. And you, when you see them come out or, you know, you go and see the show that you're like, oh, I really would love to do that. <laughs> right. you know, the person that's playing the role is good. Um, and nine times out of 10, they are, you know, like it's, right. there is a reason why people have been cast in shows. And it could be down to the fact that, you know, you're too old or I'm six foot three. So someone being cast against me can be quite different. That It might look very strange that I'm so tall and the, the leading person next to me is quite short. So it could just be a look thing. Right, um, right. Yeah, you know, there's so many different factors. So you have to you have to remember all of that after you get over yourself and say, right, right. Like, <laughs> you'll, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. <laughs> now, you mentioned before in passing, and I realized I hadn't done my research on this about the, uh, you know, the stability that you need in a, an unstable world, namely the arts, to be there for your family, to raise the kids, to uh, bring home from food to put on the table. Are you are you in a family now? Are you in the family way now? Uh, on June 19th, I have a little miracle coming. And so uh, my partner and I are very excited. And ah. uh, yes, yeah, so that's first time dad and um, <laughs> Good for right you. time of the life. It's going to it's going to be phenomenal. I, I, I it's something that my partner and I spoke about and we said, yeah, like, I think we're ready now. And thank God, because I, I am ready to to have that focus on somebody else and to, to yeah. sort of just let go and, and live and love someone um, as much as, you, you know, can love your partner. I, my friends have uh, two babies. And when he had his first baby boy, I just remember holding him going, why do I love this human yeah, being right. so much? <laughs> and it's not even mine. So I can only imagine how it's going to be in a couple of months time when I'm holding my own baby. Have you seen the uh, the sonograms yet? Have you seen the baby in the womb? Seen the baby? Yeah. Uh, we don't know what we're having. Uh, we kept that a secret uh, a surprise for ourselves, but for everyone as well. But just to just to hold on to something. Yeah. Wow. I, 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 everyone tells me that uh, when they finally have that baby in their arms, they realize that they never knew the depth of their love, that they could love some other human being this much and literally be willing to lay down their life for them. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how how you do in the daddy department there, Stephen. That's that's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now uh, everything of, is going to change. <laughs> speaking of the daddy department, let's go back in time. Family of origin. L- the folks who raised you. Uh, now that you're going to be 
one of the folk who raises somebody else. What did your folks do right? They put a roof over my head. They fed me. They gave me every opportunity that I could possibly want to do. Um, you know, we we didn't come from a lot of money, but I know that they they sacrificed, you know, hours and hours of work so that we could do dance classes. We could go to play soccer. We could play baseball. We could, you know, go to rugby tournaments. We could go away on weekends with friends. Um, mm -hmm. I was never dressed in the best clothes, which was something as a young kid I never really understood. Like I wanted the brands and I wanted the things. Yeah. Uh, but I slowly realized as I got older, it's that's not important. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they gave they gave me love and respect. Uh, they had they gave me some wonderful siblings as well that I really get along with, which is incredible. Um, and you know, my mum would do anything. My, so my father would do anything for me. They're my number one supporters. They've been to every show that I've ever done. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I think if a, if a show was sitting in Sydney for over a few months, they'd see it every weekend. <laughs> That's great. So I, I, was, I was never never um, lacking support in that in that sense. They gave me freedom to do what I wanted to do and find my path. Yeah. But Stephen May is our guest. Stephen, but um, you know and I know that that uh, lots of folks go into the arts, and we all do our our college plays and all the rest of it. But ultimately, parents, I'm told, usually want stability for their kid you know the regular paycheck the the pension at the end of the day were your parents okay with you saying i'm going to take that leap of faith of involving myself in a life of the arts it's very interesting because they always say oh what's next what's next and it's like hang on i've just i've just <laughs> I've just done this one you know how are you going for money you know and it i'm sure that they are they may ask my sisters that but it is that kind of i think they do think it's still a hobby because it is fun, you know. It's it's not work per se when you when you're getting up there and you you're playing eight shows a week or you get to do a TV series and they think, okay, you know, I think they don't take the moment to celebrate and and maybe I don't either to take a take a moment to celebrate what I'm actually doing because mm -hmm. as I said, it's fun. Um, you know, you don't you don't work a day in your life if you're doing what you love. So you know, uh, I, I think you you would understand this very much that. Uh, you are you come across as a person of enormous energy. Uh, if I were a guessing person, I'd say you have the kind of dynamic energy of a person in their 20s. You know, and I know you're not a kid in your 20s anymore. Uh, in, in a world, and in the arts especially, where they can sometimes seem to worship very, very young people more than uh, talent, how do you feel about the whole process of the reality that if we're alive, we're all aging, and how well do you put that in perspective? Well, very recently, uh, that was the first time I was in an audition and they said, that was brilliant. You know, you've done, that was great. Everything is there. And the casting director came out and said, you're just too old. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> uh, and I, yeah, it, it is reality. We are going to get older and they're going to yeah. be younger and stronger and uh, funnier or good, better, good, better looking people than, uh, than you are at the time. <laughs> it's just, it is just reality. Um, I really, yeah, I feel for a lot of people that are going through it, and especially women as well. They go through it even mm -hmm. harder. Can be, you know, a certain type of look, um, and you really are pigeonholed for such a long time. Um, I'm lucky that I guess I still have when I'm clean shaven. I still have a, a youthful look, right? Uh, so I'll hold on to it as long as I can. Um, <laughs> I think the, the older I'm getting, the wiser I'm getting about sleeping more, uh, not going out as much, doing the right thing. So hopefully there's sort of this married in between bit where the younger ones are still partying and <laughs> not sleeping as much. So I look a bit more fresh when I walk in the room. You've also <laughs> got to stay in good shape because you have a kid who's going to be climbing over daddy for a long time to come. So you want to be able to pick up that child and, and take care of that kid for a long time. You know, it would be uh, unlike me, uh, since I'm in the business of uh, of the God world, not to ask, were you raised anything in particular in terms of anything spiritual? Uh, we weren't raised in anything particular. We had um, like a scripture practice at school uh. once a week. Um, and then we went to what we call Sunday school, which was going to um, going to church on a Sunday uh, growing up. And we would read passages from the Bible and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't necessarily uh, something we practiced at home or that my parents really, they were um, born Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where they come from. These days, I really work on more of a spiritual level myself in the sense that I believe that there is 
guides or angels or there is something around us that is helping us um i tap into that and i believe that the universe provides and you know i say universe and some people say god and some people say um you know buddha or whatever they uh, mm-hmm. uh, attach to and i i do believe there is a greater spiritual sense around me that i've always had uh and i've yeah, meditate a lot, and I you I do list, try to listen to what's happening. Uh, it's really hard to trust the universe mm-hmm. and that everything's going to be fine. Um, especially, I, I think the the biggest thing that I'm seeing is now is the creation of a person inside yeah, yeah. the partner and thinking how 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 is this how is this happening? You know, like to the simplest thing of measuring from the top of the baby's uh, sorry the top of the yeah. mother's stomach down to the pelvis every week is the is the centimeters of that um body shape is the week of the child so yeah. at 32 weeks it's 32 centimeters the size of the belly and i'm like how how does the body <laughs> right <laughs> what what is what is this world like how is the human race created like this it's very unfair that they have to do it all yeah. um but i do but there has to be some kind of other being or other power that has created such a wonderful human being that can create a baby you know i think it's phenomenal yeah you're you're onto something there steve and i i had the chance to be one of those lamaze coaches when my nephew was born and and uh, you can't watch a baby in the womb or see a child come into the world without realizing how it's nothing less than miraculous and uh and as you say there's a source of being and who is that source and you meditate to find that source now i'll get into another I- equally interesting topic to me in, in new, not just new york but throughout the country united states Actors so often, for better or worse, get themselves involved in, in politics. You have people on the far left and you have people on the far right. We're uh, going to have an interview with John Boyd, who identifies as a conservative republic, great actor. And then you have people like Martin Sheen, who identify on the far left. Um, it, it's a mixed bag, to be honest with you. Uh, there are people who will listen to them. There are people who are saying, why should I listen to an actor on issues of politics? In Australia, is it the same? Do people get involved politically or do you guys stay far clear away from all that? Uh, I think it's not it's not as prevalent as as it is in the United States. Um, it's not as big. There are, we do run for what we believe in it, and we do run for the arts uh, purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, definitely. Yeah, there is. There's definitely one side that supports the arts more so. We've just voted in uh, over the last couple of years our mm-hmm. government, uh, which is the Labor. We have Labor and Liberal. Uh, the right. Labor government is very much more a supporting of the arts, even uh-huh. have arts funding. Um, how the arts will be recognised um, very much happens through Labor. Through Liberal, it's not so much about the arts, um, even mm. to the point where they didn't even have an arts minister. They combined them with the road and. Um, I think it was roads and maritime thing. They'd be like, oh, don't worry. We'll put the roads guy with the arts guy. And <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. You're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> and and it, was, it was quite interesting during the pandemic because, you know, the, the, the artists were the first to be locked down and the last to go back because you, could, you couldn't put mm. 2,000 people back into a theatre even when we started to open up. So we were the last kind of group of people around that that are having to go back to the arts. And the government... For a while, it took about four four or five months for them to recognize that, hey, you just, you know, millions of people have just been unemployed. You're not giving them benefits. You're not supporting them. How are we going to do this? Um, And so, yeah, we, everybody rallied then. Um, And I think the the Labor government and our representative, um, Tony Burke, through that really did help us. And now that we're seeing them in in government, uh, we're seeing some changes. I think the arts is always going to suffer because people think it's a hobby and it's not as... uh, right. Not as not as big as you know the amount of money that people are bringing in, but if you think about it's a it's a billion dollar business here, even in Australia, uh, and the amount of tourism that brings from you know anyone seeing a show in Sydney at the Opera House or coming to Melbourne and seeing, we're a very big, very big sports country, so we're mm-hmm. competing with the AFL and the Rugby League and the Union, union Big Tennis competitions when the Australian Open right, comes. Right. So we like we're fighting very hard for it, um, and unlike the states, you don't see the reward as much. So our films, they get played on screen, but we buy a lot of American and uh, British TV shows and e- and even um, films, yeah. Now, now Stephen Mayer's our guest. Stephen, when you use the term of the, the Liberal Party, so your Liberal Party is actually the more conservative party then, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah the very misleading names. I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me ask you, Carol Channing, who was the original Hello, Dolly in New York, was a guest. 
uh, before she went home to God. And, and she talked about the fact that she wanted to fight for more funding for arts in the schools, that that's where we should begin at grade school, high school. Is there much support for the arts in education? Uh, it doesn't sound like there is. I mean, mm. I, I was very fortunate and I grew up in a school where that's all I did. I, I, did, I picked up an instrument and I did plays and I... Uh, it's encouraging the the not uh, how can I word it? It's the as a white male, I'm very privileged and I can do what I want. Uh, mm -hmm. Yet someone of of an Aboriginal Torres Strait Island descent here may not have the money or the education or the support network, and so it's on the fringes of people of different demographics that I don't think the arts gets funded too. So if you go to an affluent school, yes, you will get funding and you can do what you want. If you don't, it's not necessarily targeted as an arts section um yeah. you know parents can't afford to go to dance classes or singing lessons or acting classes so it's very hard for them to get access to that um but yet you mm. see in churches and in um lots of different groups there's so much singing and we all come from from art we all come from this expression of either music or telling a story um and so i think it's just told in a different way i don't know that the funding bleeds down to the to the younger schools. Uh, I know that once I, you know, go, I went to a university in Western Australia, which is an Academy of Performing Arts, and I got a Bachelor of Arts uh, in Music Theatre. Now, I was privileged enough that I could audition for it and I was there, but it was a bunch of white people doing a course. And so, you know, we now in Australia, we're moving towards multiculturalism and having diverse groups of people do things. And I think that's what has suffered it especially with my generation, but the younger generation, we, we're starting to see more diversity on screen, on stage, um, throughout the nation, which is actually, you know, Australia is made up of so many different people and mm -hmm. you couldn't say what I look like is the typical Australian person because you, I could walk outside and then all, everybody looks very, very different and they, could, they look like they come from it different countries but we all have the same broad australian accent yeah Stephen may has been our guest i want to thank you Stephen, for our listeners and watchers is a marvelous actor singer dancer all the rest of a talented artistic guy but i wanted to share with uh our listeners and viewers today some of the thoughts he has uh, about many aspects of life but Stephen, we just wish you aside from uh, the fact that you are uh, to us on camera here eternally young so you should get any part you want but aside from that, uh, much good luck in your uh, your next incredible and beautiful challenge of being the, the best parent you can be. And uh, I think that child is wonderfully lucky to have somebody like you, sensitive, intelligent, funny, and kind. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful thing. Good luck with the journey of parenthood. Have a good night. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye. As we end today's program, I want to thank you all for being with us. If you need to contact me, you can reach me at personallyspeakingpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.